Hello and welcome to another episode of Without Pain Wednesday, where we get together once a week to talk about a different topic related to getting out of the back pain cycle for good. Today we're going to be talking about something I've called the back pain diet, which is a common mistake people make when they think about getting out of back pain, kind of a mindset that I'd like to uh, use an analogy to clear up and uh, make it a little more uh, realistic about what to expect when getting out of back pain. And so uh, I, I believe using this analogy will be a, an excellent way to relate what I'm trying to talk about and hopefully be really helpful for a lot of people. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Dr. Ryan Peebles. I'm a doctor of physical therapy by profession, but my school of thought is much more of a melting pot of different uh, methods and philosophies that I've discovered over the years. I've dedicated the last 20 years of my life to better understanding and reversing the root causes of chronic lower back pain. So we're going to get right into the topic. Uh, hopefully my volume and everything is working all right. Uh, this is a live stream, so uh, let me know if it's not. And we're going to talk about it. So first, let's talk about the problem. The problem that I see, and I've seen time and time again, and I will say that I was guilty of this problem too in my personal journey, so I can apply this to myself. The problem is that people believe, people with back pain tend to believe that they are searching for a fix or something that's going to help them, uh, a reasonable thing, and then once they have helped themselves or have gotten that help, and solved the problem, that they can be just a normal person again and never have to think about back pain again. And they can finish this solution. So maybe that's going to physical therapy, maybe it's going to the chiropractor, maybe it's a, a new device. And so they can use this solution for a period of time. And then once they have gotten that the benefits from that solution, they can just go back to their normal life. And so we're going to apply the concept of dieting and losing weight to this uh, as an analogy to help explain why this actually is not the case. So we all know that the diet is a uh, short term solution and it has a lot of uh, it. it in the long term, it often fails. And that's because people with the goal of losing weight will go on a diet, maybe it will work. And then when they finish the diet and go back to their normal way of eating and lifestyle, they gain the weight right back. And so what we've learned with weight loss is that it's not about a short term solution, but about a lifestyle change. And that's what I want you to think about back pain. So whatever the solution is, whether it's core balance training or chiropractic or whatever you believe will help you. I hope you find that help. When you imagine yourself in the future, finishing that solution and going back to normal again, I want you to ask yourself, what is normal? Does the normal person have to deal with back pain? The answer is yes. Actually, back pain is more common than obesity or being overweight. 80% of people will experience back pain at some point in their lives. So to be able to get to a point where you're done with the solution and you're normal again is somebody who has to deal with back pain. And so I want you, and, and the, like I said before, I was guilty of this when I was in my search and my journey for over a decade, I imagined that someday I would find my solution and I would be victorious and then I could go back to my normal life. And maybe what I imagined as normal, uh, as a normal person that didn't have to deal with back pain or even think about it was maybe like when I was a kid, you know, a, a kid doesn't usually have to deal with back pain. Um, so maybe that's what I imagined I would be able to get back to, but that's not actually the case. 
And I, as a someone who's dedicated my life to this and successfully gotten out of back pain, still have to deal with back pain sometimes, depending on how I treat my body. And so I want to set the expectations for you, uh, no matter what the solution is, uh, we, you have to think about it as a lifestyle change, a behavioral change. And so, um, you know, if we're going to use the analogy of dieting, somebody who's trying to lose weight needs to change the way that they eat on a permanent basis to be able to keep the weight off. Or maybe it's not just eating, but the way that they, uh, th their lifestyle, maybe be more active and be more fit. But whatever that solution is, it has to be a permanent change in order to have permanent results. And so that's the way I want you to think about back pain is whatever you're going to do, whether it's uh, physical therapy, chiropractic, core balance training, the solution, the permanent solution is to make that change permanently. So uh, if chiro chiropractic works for you, that's something you're, you're going to want to commit to uh, for the rest of your life. Or, you know, physical therapy, I, I do believe as a physical therapist by profession, I do believe that the biggest problem with physical therapy as a solution to back pain is that people go for a few weeks, they get better, and then they get discharged, and then the problem returns. I went through that cycle countless times. And so if the solution for you is physical therapy, doing, you know, a physical therapy uh, exercise program, then you should plan on doing that for the rest of your life. The way that we approach the solution with core balance training is not to depend on exercises to keep us out of pain permanently. It's the, the, the ultimate goal is to apply this new relationship to our body, to learn a new relationship and then apply it to everything we do in life so that we don't have to uh, commit to an exercise routine for the rest of our lives, but instead going to do the thing that you want, you want to do or need to do in your daily life, such as dishes or yard work, or maybe it is going to the gym, but you're doing the routine that you want to do. Uh, or it could even be a, just an extra extracurricular activity. Doing that thing in a healthier way is the behavior change that makes the solution a permanent one. And so this is a mindset shift. It's not so much, uh, you know, I, I do believe that about 90% of the solution to back pain is mental. And it's, it's these types of concepts and commitments that you want to make to yourself that is going to be the most effective for you. Of course, you can have a solution be given to you like an exercise program in a physical therapy clinic, and then you can just do the exercises and continue to do them on a, on a permanent basis. And, and that's a primarily a physical solution. Uh, but you should plan on doing that indefinitely, committing to that uh, as, a, as a regular practice. So uh, that is my soapbox for today. Uh, I hope that is meaningful or helpful to you or to someone. And I do want to say that if this is the way that you've thought about back pain and getting out of back pain in the past, that that's okay. It's actually normal. That's the way that I thought about it for a long time. And uh, I was searching far and wide for the solution that would fix me. And I could just go back to my normal life and never have to think about back pain again. But the more I learn, the more I realize that a normal life is someone that has to take care of their body and do healthy things and do them in a healthy way uh, to protect their back. That is normal. So uh, that's the message. I do see a couple uh, posts in the chat. Let me take a look here. Uh, Chris Manhart showing up today. Uh, good to see you. And you have officially become one of our core members showing up so many times live. I uh, love to see it. And thank you for the information that you can see and hear me. Uh, Nathan, thank you for the birthday wishes. Yeah, it was uh, last Tuesday. 
I was in Big Sur, California. Uh, if you haven't been there and you eventually, uh, and, if, and if you don't live in California, if you do come to California, I think it's one of the top destinations to see. It's, it's a paradise. So I had a nice time there. Thank you. And uh, it says, I happened to catch a stream live on Tuesday last week. Oh, yeah, you did. You were there live. You were probably like the only person because I was, I was off timing. Um, you mentioned right at the end, couldn't get a comment on stream fast enough before it ended. Oh, yeah, I did mention my birthday. Uh, David Wathen, good to see you here. And Rob, good to see you guys. Uh, love seeing you show up live. So uh, I do have a few questions from uh, the students in the program to get through today. And it was pretty much, um, you know, the topic was a short one today, but a very important one. So uh, if you, if it resonated with you, let me know and um, support the stream, hit the like button and help YouTube spread the word so I can get this message out there to more people uh, that, that getting out of back pain is not a diet. It's actually a lifestyle change. So uh, let's go on to the questions. I do believe we have a somewhat of a featured student today. Uh, I just wanted to actually honor Antoinette because she made a post in the uh, in one of the lessons in the deadlift lesson, which is somewhere in module seven, I believe. Uh, and it's on topic with the stream. So Antoinette says, thank you for the advice. I also love aerial yoga and hoping to be able to start back to it. I'll first start on my mat practicing with body intelligence. I get it's about the long haul and not immediate results. And uh, so that is a huge advantage to anyone that can, that can come to that conclusion uh, on their own and early. So you can prepare yourself that whatever solution you're doing, you're committing to for the rest of your life. And, and, and if you don't, then there's a, you know, uh, if, if you return back to the old lifestyle, you know, this is, this is something I may have, should have mentioned earlier. If you return back to the old lifestyle that you had that caused you the back pain in the first place, then you can only expect that it's going to cause you back pain again. And so you want to consider that whatever the solution is that you are using, you're making a long-term commitment to that solution. And if that solution is not something that you want to make a long-term commitment to because it's too expensive or it depends on somebody else putting their hands on you and adjusting you or some device that you have to hook yourself up to and you don't want to do that on an, uh, on for the rest of your life, then you might want to consider searching for a different solution, a more realistic one that you may even enjoy integrating into your life for the long term. So uh, just honoring Antoinette and she uh, let's just read the rest of her comment. Posterior tilt has become my new best friend in my movement and will definitely use it during my yoga practice. Uh, mindset was the hardest adjustment I've had to make. I was someone who had prescribed to the more you push, the better your results. Now I bring it close to my edge, but don't push over it. Uh, that's another topic that I, I, I actually preach in the program on I'm not going to preach about it today but if you uh, read what she says there is a lot of wisdom in this statement I was someone who had prescribed to the more you push the better your results now I bring it close to my edge of my threshold of what you're capable of doing without pain but I don't push over that threshold and the goal is to extend that threshold outward over time, over days and weeks. So uh, excellent, Antoinette. Uh, anyone with um, stenosis or spondylolisthesis, uh, posterior tilt may become your best friend if you discover uh, how helpful it can be for relieving those conditions. I have both of them. So I, I know uh, firsthand how valuable that it can be. Uh, so let's see, we got uh, some comments in the chat. Thank you, Sherry, for the birthday wishes. Rob, my birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday to you, Rob. Uh, November, all right. I love Sherry. And you, you must be a Sagittarius 
So I am also a Sagittarius, so we share a few things. Awesome. And David, 60 here, finally ready to make a lifestyle change for back pain. All right. You know, we all wish we did it earlier, David. Uh, I did it relatively early in my life, but I still wish I would have done it even earlier than that. So uh, the best time is today, and the second best time is tomorrow to make the change. Diane, I see... Uh, post in the chat, I manage my RA with diet and lifestyle, not pharmaceuticals. Now manage my, managing my lumbar back pain with the new skill set you've taught me and integrating in my daily life. Uh, love to hear that, Diane. I recognize your name from some co uh, previous comments in the program. Uh, love seeing all the students here. So thank you guys for being here. Um, <clears throat> be sure to hit that like button and, and help spread the word. This is uh, something that I believe I feel passionate about that... Uh, you know, I believe this message should be out there to more people so that we can help to fix the broken back pain industry. It's a it's a billion dollar industry, a hundred billion dollar industry, I believe. And it's uh, it, it's not improving people's lives. The larger industry is not improving people's lives in, in most cases, in at least 50 percent of cases. So. Uh, I just appreciate everyone's support. So this might be you, David. Uh, we got a comment in the anchor triad lesson. I noticed that in your demonstration of the anchor triad that your palms turned outward. Good observation, David. I don't talk about that, but it is something I do with anchor triad. Is that an integral part of achieving the anchor triad or just something that should come natural out of it? Uh, I have never asked my que myself that question. If is it integral? Um, it's funny if you see any skeleton or uh, you know kind of uh, portrayal of the human body, the hand, the palms are always facing forward. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a, you know that that's that's it's called anatomical position, and so. That's actually not why I do it. I do it for a totally different reason. So I'm going to talk about the reason why I have palms facing forward. And um, so I'm going to stand up for this. Okay. I don't know if I can get far enough back. Uh, let's do a different audio so you guys can hear me better. So this audio is going to sound different, but it'll capture my voice from farther away. Let's see. <clears throat> All right. So when we talk about posture, one of the predictable patterns is that we close up. And closing up is internal rotation. The body curls forward. And so the arms internally rotating is part of that pattern. And so we're trying to reverse that pattern. And so that's why I open my arms like this. And the rotation doesn't happen from the wrist. It happens from the shoulder. Okay. And so I'm opening up my body. You can think of a flower. Okay. A flower opens up and then it closes down to die. That's what we do as humans, right? We all know that. We, we start curled up we open up and then we close back down. And so the goal is to try and stay as uh, stay open for as long as possible. <clears throat> so hopefully that answers your question. I think that's probably you that uh, asked that, David. And I'm going to switch my audio back. So uh, that doesn't only apply to the arms. It actually applies to the legs as well. The, from the hips. So we want to, the, the hips have this, you know, closing down is, is the same thing. It's towards closing down uh, posture, everything. So we want that spiral. It's, it's an external rotation spiral. And I do incorporate that into some of the exercises in the program. Uh, you could think of the butt buster bridge in that way, where we were uh, pushing out with our hips, same thing with the squat. And, uh, there will be a future lesson at some point in the program where I talk directly about this. Um, but it's not there yet. And, and, uh, the program is going to continually evolve and grow as it, as it always has. So 
Uh, I'm going to take a look, look in the chat because there's been some more comments. So, uh, Rob, my question here is, can this program reverse my anterior pelvic tilt when I am stuck in sympathetic dominance? <clears throat> so, Rob, that's a good question. I know that you're not asking, can this program reverse anterior pelvic tilt, period, because the answer to that, I hope it's obvious, the answer to that is yes, that's one of the main goals of the program. The anterior tilt is part of the predictable pattern of closing down posture, um, and we do aim to reverse that. But with, if you feel that you're stuck in sympathetic dominance, for anyone that doesn't know what that is, we, ha we can be in, you know, we have the sympathetic nervous system and we have the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic is the more... Uh, it could be compared to uh, fight or flight. You know, it's more high energy, more protective, more de uh, defensive, uh, and that would be in more in alignment with the protective position of of the fetal position of the body closing up. And parasympathetic uh, is a state of relaxation, of digestion, of of rest. So. Um, that is a legitimate question, Rob, and I don't know that I can say a strong yes or a strong no. Um, if you guys hear a bird in the background, uh, we, we got a lot of birds around here. Uh, apologies. I just want to acknowledge the loud bird. Um, it's a scrub jay. I'm into birds a little bit. So, uh, so with sympathetic dominance, I think that there's going to be a large psychological component. And, and I even said that earlier on the stream, 90% of back pain is psychological if you're talking about the long-term solution. Um, so you're going to want to address the, you know, all the components that are involved in that, the multifactorial causes there. Um, but there is an, going to be an element of, of the physical. And so... This program is addressing uh, both. You know, my goal with these streams is often to address the mental, the psychological, the mindset component, and the inside the program, uh, where you know it's definitely a physical component, and we're also trying to you know download the learnings into our our daily movement, which would be more of a, a mental side. So uh, yes, I, I do think it can help, and I I think that. You, Whatever else that you can, um, you know, complement with core balance training to address uh, that, you know, there's there is something to be said about the vagus nerve um, in in the relationship to sympathetic versus parasympathetic, and I haven't gone down that rabbit hole yet. I'm sure I will one day, but um, to try and complement with. Uh, addressing those other factors. Uh, good question, Rob. I wish I had a better answer for you, but uh, I don't. <laughs> uh, David says, behind you, uh, the skeleton. Yeah. Yes. The, I noticed that that skeleton back there is in the anatomical position. Um, and then David says, yes. And it is related that many from the East casually walk with their hands behind them. Yeah, uh, I noticed that. It seems very cultural to me. Uh, it's a very—it seems like very relaxed, uh, you know, way of walking. And I've noticed that it's really common among the elderly, uh, not so much among among like children or or younger people. So uh, I'm not sure what it what it is about that, but the harms behind them would actually be internally rotated i think their palms are facing backwards so i don't uh, not really sure they there are certain things about their culture and lifestyle that are that is uh, leads to healthier spines the way they sit uh, especially uh all right great rob uh, glad to hear and we're going to move on to the next question with uh elliot so this is the back anchor challenge two this is in module four probably day three, I believe. And it's a progression of uh, the back anchor challenge. 
So, the, you know, I'm hesitant always about putting this uh, exercise so it's relatively early in the program uh, because I don't want people to um, I don't want people to think that they have to do this progression quite yet. And part of the problem of having a program for uh, such a wide spectrum of people is that I'm dealing with people of all f different fitness levels. So I have to put this in early enough to address those people with very high fitness and also want to be able to send the message to people that aren't ready for it that there is no rush. So let's see what Elliot has to say. Yes, these are great, but I am still struggling with my quads in the bridge. Okay, this is a quad, uh, bridge question, actually. They are on. I tried the alternative version and it does seem better, meaning my hamstrings turned on like you said. Should I stick with that version? Uh, yeah, Elliot, I think you should until you can, we're dealing with patterns here. Oh, I'm, I realize I haven't been showing the slide. So here's a quick view of the slide, uh, but we'll go back to full screen. So that was Elliot's question. So, um, and we're dealing with patterns here and the goal is to change the pattern and you can think of it like a software program and the body does have a default program uh, that it goes to. And right now that might be quads dominating most movements for you. Um, and so we need to do something to change that pattern. And if that means doing the bridge on a foam roll, I prefer the one where the foam roll is under your back and not under your feet. Uh, and that can help turn the, you know, the hamstrings on and, and that through reciprocal inhibition will turn the quads off a little bit. Um, that might, for doing that for a period of time might be enough to break you out of the pattern. And then you can progress towards doing the normal bridge and see if you can continue this new pattern and do a little bit more, uh, you know, um, grooving of the pattern into your um, normal movement. And so that's the way I would look at it for you. That's why I introduced that progression. Elliot is for people that are struggling with overusing the quads in the bridge. And so you need to use it to your own unique uh, situation and level of fitness. And some people don't need that progression. And so you do it once and you move on to the next progression and you find the one that works best for you. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, Thank you, Asti, for the full screen. I realized that I did switch back to it, and I'll go back to the slides. Here we are. So in the Module 2 assessment, Sherry uh, commented, yes, my spine isn't fused, but it feels fused. My only challenge is lowering my back anchors first. My spine wants to go down as one. That is a... Uh, I'm glad you shared this. It's not really a question, but it's probably a common feeling that people have. And I, it's a feeling that I can actually remember having. And so uh, the spine feels fused. It's probably stiff. It probably has tons of stiff joints in a, a lot of the different levels. You know, it could be stiff from L5 all the way up through T1. You know, that, that that's actually not so uncommon. Uh, but with that stiffness, there's always going to be a really mobile joint somewhere so that you can do your normal movement in daily life. And so that might be L5S1. And that might be, this is all hypothetical, but that might be your problem area, the disc that's degenerating. And so there is a ton of stiffness in all the levels above it and they're mo not mo really moving at all. And so somewhere has to move for you, for you to be able to twist and, you know, reach and do things in life. And so it is important. I'm going to just highlight for you first, Sherry, that it's important that you uh, address that and be able to learn how to move uh, the different levels of your spine. I don't recommend foam rolling the lumbar spine ever. But uh, once you get to module three, you're going to get to a lesson called uh, thoracic mobility on the foam roll. And I highly recommend that particular exercise for you and for most people with lower back pain to get more mobility in that thoracic 
section of your spine and learn how to get some control of the movement in that area. And then um, continue to, uh, and I would only roll down to as far as the bottom of your rib cage. And I wouldn't go into the lumbar spine. That's just not something I can recommend without supervision. Uh, and then continue to work on the things that are challenging for you. So one of the things, one of the kind of themes of the program is if something is challenging for you, it's probably a sign that there's benefits to be gained. And just because you can't do something today doesn't mean you won't be able to do it just by spending more time working on it. And so it may not be that you're doing it wrong or that there's a trick that you need to learn to be able to do it right. Uh, it, it may just mean that your body hasn't done that in a while and it's going to take time to learn that. And it may take effort to learn also to loosen up some of the, those stiff joints just through repetition. And that's a lot, a lot of the time what the situation is, is it's just going to take time and that's okay. That's the hardest part about all this. So um, I'm just glad that you're aware of what's important, Sherry, and that what's challenging for you. And I would I would encourage you to keep practicing it. And and when you get to that foam roll lesson to implement that. And uh, yeah, yeah, it seems like you have great body awareness. So continue practicing tuning into your body and feeling that and focusing on the areas that you find challenging and, and need to improve. All right, we're moving on to the next one. This is from Joey posted in the back anchor progression. That's day three of the program. Hey doctor, I just had a back episode five days ago. Seems to be bulging disc and SI joint problems. Should I be trying this move yet? Uh, that, this is a great question in the sense that it's extremely common. So, uh, Joey asks, you know, we can apply this to so many different situations and people. Basically, I have fill in the blank. I have a bulging disc. I just had a herniated disc. I am having, you know, I just irritated my SI joints. Should I be doing this yet? And the answer is always across the board going to be you're the only one that will actually be able to know that based on what your body communicates to you as you're doing it. So if you get down on the floor and you're, if we're going to talk about the back anchor progression, you've already done the back anchor awareness. How does that feel? Just connecting your back anchor. If it feels okay, then how about pushing away from that back anchor a little bit more? If it feels okay, then you can continue to progress that. If it feels real iffy, if it feels wrong, if it feels like intuitively like your body is not ready for that yet and something feels like it might, uh, you know, injure if you push harder, then that's the communication that you have to listen to. And I won't be able to know that. The best doctor in the world won't be able to know that uh, because the only one that can listen and hear what your body's communicating is you. So I, I hate to give what I feel like kind of a blunt answer, but that is the truth. And so I encourage you to just take it real easy, real low intensity and experiment with pushing it a little bit at a time, 1% increases and feel what your body is communicating. Oftentimes for people, it feels good. Uh, in some cases, if there's a bulge in the disc and it's pressing on a nerve, it may feel bad. It may feel uh, sharp pain or, or may feel like nerve pain. And so that's when you would want to back off. I don't recommend pushing through bad pain or sharp pain or nerve pain. Uh, and you'll want to only do what you're capable of. And we can even refer back to what Antoinette said earlier when she said, you know, the, the best thing you can do is go up to your threshold and don't push through it. Just work right at that edge with the goal of extending that threshold outward each session over a period of days and weeks. Maybe even 1% increases, um, but over a long enough time period that leads to massive progress. If you increased 1% per day, 
then over a period of a year, you have 365% improvement. So uh, 1% is a massive improvement. And, uh, and so the entire guide for you about what you can do and what you should stay away from is your own body and it's going to require tuning in and listening to it so hopefully that helps and um i hope that helps other people too it, it, this answer applies to so many different situations let's go on to the next one uh, post in the chat from florence how long should we be holding the bridge okay let's address that like to uh prioritize people here live. So Florence, the goal is to hold the bridge as long, like if you're up in the bridge, um, to hold it as long as you can maintain connection, core connection. So that's what we learn in the first three days of the program. If you're on day four of, you know, doing the bridge, that connection, that back anchor connection should be maintained throughout and the breathing continuously uh, down and back. That does it takes practice it's challenging uh, but that's the goal is to hold the bridge as long as you can maintain that strong connection if you feel like you lose connection then come down reset and come up again and that's okay that's actually what that, it's expected for everyone at some point so maybe that's only five seconds for you or maybe it's one whole minute it doesn't really matter how long it is the goal is to get to the point where you're at your edge and challenge yourself. And that edge is where we make progress. Uh, it could be fi a five minute bridge if you're extremely fit, or it could be that you are not even able to come up into the bridge at all. And so you want to go, you want to do what you can. And that might be, you know, five seconds of strong effort. Uh, and no matter where you are on your journey, no matter where you are on your fitness level, you will get the same amount of benefits or more for people with lower level of fitness can get even more benefits uh, just by challenging yourself to that level. It's the challenge that brings the benefits, not how long you hold the bridge, not how hard you do the exercise. Uh, it's the challenge. So hopefully that answers the question, Florence. Uh, and we, I don't recommend just doing repetitions. Uh, there are benefits to it, but there are a lot more benefits, benefits to holding and maintaining the position because what we're doing in this program is posture training. So we'll go back to the slides here. And this one is from, uh, I guess this is a really similar question. So this is from Sherry. Uh, she posted in the module two assessment, I can do movements as I should be, but I can't maintain them for more than 10 to 30 seconds. I just keep repeating for five minutes. Is this acceptable to do, or do I need to maintain each for five minutes straight? Wow. I literally just answered this. So Sherry, if you are starting to watch this right now, go back and watch the last couple minutes of what I just said. And, uh, and I'm going to reiterate my answer. So uh, the, you are, what you're doing is exactly right. If you can't maintain the connection and doing the exercise for more than 10 to 30 seconds, then you should not be doing the exercise for more than 10 to 30 seconds. We want to prioritize maintaining the connection and the healthy, continuous breathing throughout. And then once you get to that point of fatigue or where your form falters, then you take a break and then reset and start again. And you want to do that, do that, repeat that cycle for a five minute period. And that is where you will get the maximum amount of benefits without setting yourself back. And you do not absolutely do not need to do maintain each for five minutes. Uh, maximum benefits come from challenging yourself the appropriate amount for your unique individual fitness level and you cannot get more benefits by doing it a different way than that so hopefully that answers your question i uh, love that the the chat the question in the chat and the the plan pre-planned question happened uh at the same time pretty much the same type of question different question requiring the same answer uh, this one is posted from Margie in Thoracic Mobility with a Foam Roll. I did refer to this lesson earlier in the stream. 
Uh, Margie says, I keep having multiple migraines daily. Never had this before. Is there an exercise to try and reverse this? Should I see the chiropractor for a tweak? I'm trying to quit the chiropractor. Thanks. Okay, so I believe there was more to this message from Margie, and I believe that maybe the there she might be associating this foam roll thoracic mobility exercise with the migraines. And so I'm going to uh, answer the question in that sense. So Margie, if you feel that the migraines are associated with doing this exercise, what I can say is uh, what I know is that there's a lot of different causes of migraines and they're not fully understood and they're often multifactorial. Um, and I don't think that the thoracic mobility on the foam roll would be a cause, like a root cause of the migraine, although it could have triggered migraines for you. And so they, whatever other conditions or situations that are going on with your environment or your body that may be leading to migraines, um, could have been just pushed over the edge by doing this exercise. And, and I, I genuinely don't think that this exercise would be, I, I haven't he ever heard of it causing migraines before, and I don't think it would be a root cause. So that's the way kind of I see it. And also regarding what can you do to reverse migraines? Like, is there an exercise to try and reverse this? Uh, should I see a chiropractor? And I, I really, don't have a, a strong recommendation for you because I don't know a lot about migraines. I haven't experienced migraines before. I know that they're extremely common and they're uh, they're a, a chronic problem for a lot of people um, that is not well understood. That's that's my you know the extent of my understanding of migraines. I think they're probably a very complex. And so my best recommendation to you, Margie, is to, for, for at least a period of time, stay away from the things that seem to be triggering it. So if that's the thoracic mobility on the foam roll, I would stay away from it. Uh, if you feel that there are, are any other things that trigger them, stay away from them. And uh, for things that could help, if you have in your experience and in the recent past uh, noticed that anything helps them to do more of them. And that's the general rule is do more of what's working and less of what's hurting. So maybe going for walks, maybe I know there is association with light, uh, you know, bright light and migraines. Uh, screen time can be a cause of migraines for some people. Um, and then uh, as far as chiropractic, I, I really don't know. I, I, I would definitely research both your chiropractor and chiropractic for the treatment of migraines before doing it. I wouldn't just blindly jump into that. Uh, if you know your chiropractor and trust him or her and have maybe even experienced benefits from a, uh, regarding a migraine from the chiropractor before, then that would, could be a reason to try it. But uh, otherwise, I would definitely do my research, ask my questions, and uh, and make sure to be as well informed as possible before doing something like that to treat a migraine. So hopefully that helps, Margie. Sorry to hear about the migraines, and um, and I do believe just and that if this is a recent thing that that in time it it will pass. And I know you've had a lot of success with the program, so when you get back to, uh, you know, your baseline, then you, I, I encourage you to continue doing the things that have helped you, uh, over the time going through the program. So let's go on to the last one. This is actually a question from a prospective student. So not an, uh, current student. And this is, uh, his name is Chris says, uh, and, and the message was shortened. It was a m much longer message. So, uh, just, Cherry picked out the kind of the main parts of the message. Chris says, I'm a 48 year old man and thought I was for the most part healthy and decently fit. Then boom, two bulging discs at L3 and L4 
and her a herniated L5. I'm not naive enough to think damage such as this was due to the one incident cleaning the backyard. It must have been a progressive weakening in my core over probably years. Uh, first, I just want to commend you, Chris, for coming to that realization on your own. Uh, I believe a lot of people have an, a strong association. You know, they they experience a severe onset of back pain because of some incident where they were, whether they were picking up a heavy box or a toilet paper roll off the ground and they associate the back pain with that single event. But in reality, it's rarely ever the single event and a long t amount of time of buildup of uh, lifestyle habits, poor movement patterns, uh, postural dysfunction that finally, uh, you know, the threshold was crossed and, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back with the pun intended uh, that, ca that caused the actual pain to occur. So I uh, commend you for just coming to that realization on your own. The question you asked is, should I begin this program in such an injured state as I am? I'm fearful of re-injury. I do not ever want to go through this again. Thank you, Chris. So uh, I really appreciate this question. I believe this applies to many people who are considering the program who may have just had a severe back pain episode and they're considering the program, but also considering whether it would be better to wait to start the program once they're feeling a little bit better. And my answer to that is, I don't believe there's any reason to wait to start the healing process. This program was designed for severe back pain conditions. Uh, that was what I had in my personal journey. And uh, it was designed around solving my problem. And so it is extremely gentle in the beginning. Uh, we start out with just breathing, which can offer massive amounts of relief in itself. And then we, we move on to a very gentle uh, core connection that requires you to get on the floor. So if you're unable to get up and down off the floor, then that may be a reason to hold off until you can do that. But we've even had students who start just on the bed. Actually, many students have started on the bed. Um, but the floor is better. It's a firmer surface and easier to form that connection. And just those first couple days can offer actually enough relief to where you can then do the more uh, involved movements. Um, we progress very slowly to those movements. Um, but I, I really don't believe that there's any benefit in waiting to start forming these healthy body connections that will, you know, they seem to be extremely helpful for people. And it's not even a question in my mind anymore. This program does work. We've just had an overwhelming amount of feedback from students that that it helps them. And, and so uh, that's my encouragement to you, Chris, is to um, be confident that the program is not going to hurt you in the beginning. And uh, you can always, I, I always encourage every student to listen to their body and go at their own pace as they're going through the program. So hopefully that answers your question. And um, yeah, this is this is if you haven't if you didn't watch this stream, the topic of the stream th from the beginning, this is about learning a new uh, relationship with your body, a new lifestyle of movement. And um, so it's oriented towards a long term solution. And there there really is not any benefit in waiting to start that journey. I see your question coming through in the chat from Chris Walsh. Thank you, Dr. Peoples. I'm glad to hear this. Oh, cool. You're here live. Awesome to hear. I'm glad to hear this starts off slow. I've been doing some stretching and light exercise as of late. Okay, cool. Well, that's uh, great to hear. If you can do stretches and light exercise, then uh, you'll definitely be able to start out with the program. And 
um, and you have, you know, the, the purpose of the free trial is for people like you who are unsure whether this is something for them, uh, for whatever reason, uh, it gives you some time to make that decision. And, and often that first week is enough for people to go, okay, there's something to this. I'm going to, I'm going to give this a try. And, um, or there are a fair amount of people that I, I think the most common reason that people s decide that this is not for them is that it's hard to stick with it. It's a, it's a daily commitment. It's 15 minutes a day, uh, preferably in the morning, every morning. And that is a lot to ask of people, especially in this day and age is, uh, you know, with all the things going on in our lives is the ability to add another 15 minute commitment to their lives uh, on a daily basis. And a lot of people who realize that they're not ready or able to make that commitment right now uh, will decide that, that that right now is not the time. And so I think that's the biggest factor is do you is it a good time in your life to make the commitment? And I hope that it is because that means you're prioritizing your health over everything else. And, and without your health, you know, we, everything else doesn't really matter. I, I believe this helps you to get your life back and for a lot of people that are in a severe situation. So uh, that's my encouragement. And uh, I'm, I'm, it's awesome to see you here live. Uh, if you have any other questions, you're the last one, actually. So I'm going to be signing off here in a minute. Uh, if you had any questions about that, uh, feel free to ask. And uh, as a conclusion to today's topic, uh, we the, the stream is called The Back Pain Diet. And we are using this analogy, uh, this, the dieting analogy, as, um, you know, kind of a kind of a myth that the diet will help people to lose weight so that they can then go back to their normal life as a skinnier person and keep the weight off. We've realized that through the 90s and the 2000s as America, uh, you know, got bigger, that the that that way of addressing uh, weight gain is not sustainable. And you actually have to make a behavioral change, a lifestyle change, whether that's to the foods that you eat or the the way that you use your body, your fitness, your activity level, um, on a more permanent basis, a, an actual change to who you are. The change has to happen on the inside, and making external changes to, uh, you know to go see somebody or be treated by somebody on a temporary basis does not have the capacity to have a lasting effect unless you continue to, to do that for the rest of your life. That's my personal belief anyways. So uh, make the change inward and uh, make, the, make the behavioral, the lifestyle changes to get that solu whatever that solution is to become one that's going to last you for the rest of your, of your life. And I believe that, that with back pain, that has a lot to do with the way that we relate to our bodies, the way we move, and uh, the way that we, uh, the amount that our core is involved in the movements of our daily life. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, okay, 15 minutes is an easy commitment to prevent this from happening again was the worst pain I've ever experienced, man. Yeah, I, I feel you there. Yeah, so, it, it, you know, everyone's different. And, and I'm glad you feel that 15 minutes is an easy commitment. Um, and it is, you know, if you really think about it. Uh, so I'm glad that you feel that way and I, I believe in this solution. So um, my best advice to you, Chris, while I have you here live is to listen to your body throughout the process. Don't let me determine the pace at which you go through this program. The program is an outline. It's a protocol of steps to take. 
And the best way that you can go through those steps is for you to determine what, when you're ready to move to the next step based on what your body is telling you, what your body is communicating to you while you're doing the current step. So if that's step one, then do step one, low intensity, tuning into your body, feel what your body is feeling. And if it's communicating to you, this is good, this feels good, then progress to step two. But if you're at step one and your body says, ooh, this is a little iffy, like I don't know about this yet, then spend some time with it, get up off the ground, feel how you feel for a while, and then maybe return back to step one again and and do another session. And at that point, you'll get more information. You'll get more communication from your body, which gives you more information to make a wise decision to go on to the next step or spend more time building that foundational connection that is a building block for what's to come next. Uh, and, and that's why that I think that's the best way you can go through the program because whatever comes next is built on top of what you're currently doing. That's the way it's designed. It's, it's a series of layers and you want to make sure that if you're building a house, it's built on a strong foundation and that's the foundation is what comes first. So best possible advice I can give, uh, look forward to you, uh, you know, joining the program, Chris, if you decide to, and I uh, hope to see you in there. So uh, with that, I'm going to sign off, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Just help spread this word, the, the word that there is a solution to chronic lower back pain. And um, as I said in the stream, I believe it's learning a new relationship with your body that you can continue on a permanent basis. And so that's what we try to teach here. So... I'll see you guys next week, and uh, until next time, get down on the floor and connect to your core. Take care, everyone.